The Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is pleased to present The Spinoza of Market Street by Isaac Bashevis Singer. Dr. Nachum Fischelson paced back and forth in his garret room on Market Street, Warsaw. Dr. Fischelson was a short, hunched man with a grayish beard and was quite bald, except for a few wisps of hair remaining at the nape of the neck. His nose was as crooked as a beak, and his eyes were large, dark, and fluttering like those of some huge bird. It was a hot summer evening, but Dr. Fischelson wore a black coat which reached to his knees, and he had on a stiff collar and a bow tie. From the door he paced slowly to the dormer window set high in the slanting room and back again. One had to mount several steps to look out. A candle in a brass holder was burning on the table, and a variety of insects buzzed around the flame. Now and again one of the creatures would fly too close to the fire and sear its wings, or one would ignite and glow on the wick for an instant. At such moments Dr. Fischelson grimaced. His wrinkled face would twitch, and beneath his disheveled mustache he would bite his lips. Finally he took a handkerchief from his pocket and waved it at the insects. Away, away from here! Fools and imbeciles, he scolded. You won't get warm here. You'll only burn yourself. The insects scattered, but a second later returned, and once more circled the trembling flame. Dr. Fischelson wiped the sweat from his wrinkled forehead and sighed. Like men, they desire nothing but the pleasure of the moment. On the table lay an open book, written in Latin, and on its broad margin pages were notes and comments printed in small letters by Dr. Fischelson. The book was Spinoza's Ethics, and Dr. Fischelson had been studying it for the last thirty years. He knew every proposition, every proof, every corollary, every note by heart. When he wanted to find a particular passage, he generally opened to the place immediately without having to search for it, but nevertheless he continued to study the ethics for hours every day with a magnifying glass in his bony hand, murmuring and nodding his head in agreement. The truth was that the more Dr. Fischelson studied, the more puzzling sentences, unclear passages, and cryptic remarks he found. Each sentence contained hints unfathomed by any of the students of Spinoza. Actually, the philosopher had anticipated all of the criticisms of pure reason made by Kant and his followers. Dr. Fischelson was writing a commentary on the ethics. He had drawers full of notes and drafts, but it didn't seem that he would ever be able to complete his work. The stomach ailment, which had plagued him for years, was growing worse from day to day. Now he would get pains in his stomach after only a few mouthfuls of oatmeal. God in heaven, it's difficult, very difficult, he would say to himself, using the same intonation as had his father, the late rabbi of Tishevitz. It's very, very hard. Dr. Fischelson was not afraid of dying. To begin with, he was no longer a young man. Secondly, it is stated in the fourth part of the ethics that a free man thinks of nothing less than of death, and his wisdom is a meditation not of death, but of life. Thirdly, it is also said that the human mind cannot be absolutely destroyed with the human body, but there is some part of it that remains eternal. And yet, Dr. Fischelson's ulcer, or perhaps it was cancer, continued to bother him. His tongue was always coated. He belched frequently and emitted a different foul-smelling gas each time. He suffered from heartburn and cramps. At times he felt like vomiting, and at other times he was hungry for garlic, onions, and fried foods. He had long ago discarded the medicines prescribed for him by the doctors and had sought his own remedies. He found it beneficial to take grated radish after meals and lie on his bed, belly down, with his head hanging over the side. But these home remedies offered only temporary relief. Some of the doctors he consulted insisted there was nothing the matter with him. It's just nerves, they told him. You could live to be a hundred. But on this particular hot summer night, Dr. Fischelson felt his strength ebbing. His knees were shaky, his pulse weak. He sat down to read, and his vision blurred. 
The letters on the page turned from green to gold. The lines became waved and jumped over each other, leaving white gaps as if the text had disappeared in some mysterious way. The heat was unbearable, flowing down directly from the tin roof. Dr. Fischelson felt he was inside of an oven. Several times he climbed the four steps to the window and thrust his head out into the cool of the evening breeze. He would remain in that position for so long, his knees would become wobbly. Oh, it's a fine breeze, he would murmur. Really delightful. And he would recall that according to Spinoza, morality and happiness were identical, and that the most moral deed a man could perform was to indulge in some pleasure which was not contrary to reason. Dr. Fischelson, standing on the top step at the window and looking out, could see into two worlds. Above him were the heavens, thickly strewn with stars. Dr. Fischelson had never seriously studied astronomy, but he could differentiate between the planets, those bodies which, like the Earth, revolve around the sun, and the fixed stars, themselves distant suns, whose light reaches us a hundred or even a thousand years later. He recognized the constellations which mark the path of the Earth in space and that nebulous sash, the Milky Way. Dr. Fischelson owned a small telescope he had bought in Switzerland where he had studied, and he particularly enjoyed looking at the moon through it. He could clearly make out the moon's surface, the volcanoes bathed in sunlight and the dark, shadowy craters. He never wearied of gazing at these cracks and crevices. To him they seemed both near and distant, both substantial and insubstantial. Now and then he would see a shooting star trace a wide arc across the sky and disappear, leaving a fiery trail behind it. Dr. Fischelson would know then that a meteorite had reached our atmosphere and perhaps some unburned fragment of it had fallen into the ocean or had landed in the desert, or perhaps even in some inhabited region. Yes, when Dr. Fischelson looked up into the heavens, he became aware of that infinite extension, which is, according to Spinoza, one of God's attributes. It comforted Dr. Fischelson to think that although he was only a weak, puny man, a changing mode of the absolutely infinite substance, he was nevertheless a part of the cosmos made of the same matter as the celestial bodies. To the extent that he was a part of the Godhead, he knew he could not be destroyed. In such moments, Dr. Fischelson experienced the Amor Dei Intellectualis, which is, according to the philosopher of Amsterdam, the highest perfection of the mind. Dr. Fischelson breathed deeply, lifted his head as high as his stiff collar permitted, and actually felt he was whirling in company with the earth, the sun, the stars of the Milky Way, and the infinite host of galaxies known only to infinite thought. His legs became light and weightless, and he grasped the window frame with both hands, as if afraid he would lose his footing and fly out into eternity. When Dr. Fischelson tired of observing the sky, his glance dropped to Market Street below. He could see a long strip extending from Janusz's Market to Iron Street with the gas lamps lining it merged into a string of fiery dots. Smoke was issuing from the chimneys on the black tin roofs. The bakers were heating their ovens, and here and there sparks mingled with the black smoke. The street never looked so noisy and crowded as on a summer evening. Thieves, prostitutes, gamblers, and fences loafed in the square which looked from above like a pretzel covered with poppy seeds. The young men laughed coarsely and the girls shrieked. A peddler with a keg of lemonade on his back pierced the general din with his intermittent cries. A watermelon vendor shouted in a savage voice and the long knife which he used for cutting the fruit dripped with a blood-like juice. Now and again the street became even more agitated. Fire engines, their heavy wheels clanging, sped by. They were drawn by sturdy black horses, which had to be tightly curbed to prevent them from running wild. Next came an ambulance, its sirens screaming. Then some thugs had a fight among themselves, and the police had to be called. A passerby was robbed and ran about shouting for help. 
Some wagons loaded with firewood sought to get through into the courtyards where the bakeries were located, but the horses could not lift the wheels over the steep curbs, and the drivers berated the animals and lashed them with their whips. Sparks rose from the clanging hoofs. It was now long after seven, which was the prescribed closing time for stores, but actually business had only begun. Customers were led in stealthily through back doors. The Russian policeman on the street, having been paid off, noticed nothing of this. Merchants continued to hawk their wares, each seeking to outshout the others. Gold, gold, gold! A woman who dealt in rotten oranges shrieked. Sugar, sugar, sugar! croaked a dealer of overripe plums. Heads, heads, heads! A boy who sold fish heads roared. Through the window of a Hasidic study house across the way, Dr. Fischelson could see boys with long side locks swaying over holy volumes, grimacing and studying aloud in sing-song voices. Butchers, porters, and fruit dealers were drinking beer in the tavern below. Vapor drifted from the tavern's open door like steam from a bathhouse, and there was the sound of loud music. Outside of the tavern, street walkers snatched at drunken soldiers and at workers on their way home from the factories. Some of the men carried bundles of wood on their shoulders, reminding Dr. Fischelson of the wicked who are condemned to kindle their own fires in hell. Husky gramophones poured out their raspings through open windows. The liturgy of the high holidays alternated with vulgar vaudeville songs. Dr. Fischelson peered into the half-lit bedlam and cocked his ears. He knew that the behavior of this rabble was the very antithesis of reason. These people were immersed in the vainest of passions, were drunk with emotions, and, according to Spinoza, emotion was never good. Instead of the pleasure they ran after, all they succeeded in obtaining was disease and prison, shame, and the suffering that resulted from ignorance. Even the cats which loitered on the roofs here seemed more savage and passionate than those in other parts of the town. They caterwauled with the voices of women in labor, and like demons scampered up walls and leaped onto eaves and balconies. One of the toms paused at Dr. Fischelson's window and let out a howl, which made Dr. Fischelson shudder. The doctor stepped from the window and, picking up a broom, brandished it in front of the black beast's glowing green eyes. Scat! Begone, you ignorant savage! And he wrapped the broom handle against the roof until the tom ran off. When Dr. Fischelson had returned to Warsaw from Zurich, where he had studied philosophy, a great future had been predicted for him. His friends had known that he was writing an important book on Spinoza. A Jewish-Polish journal had invited him to be a contributor. He had been a frequent guest at several wealthy households, and he had been made head librarian at the Warsaw Synagogue. Although even then he had been considered an old bachelor, the matchmakers had proposed several rich girls for him, but Dr. Fischelson had not taken advantage of these opportunities. He had wanted to be as independent as Spinoza himself. And he had been. But because of his heretical ideas, he had come into conflict with the rabbi and had had to resign his post as librarian. For years after that, he had supported himself by giving private lessons in Hebrew and German. Then, when he had become sick, the Berlin Jewish community had voted him a subsidy of 500 marks a year. This had been made possible through the intervention of the famous Dr. Hildesheimer, with whom he corresponded about philosophy. In order to get by on so small a pension, Dr. Fischelson had moved into the attic room and had begun cooking his own meals on a kerosene stove. He had a cupboard, which had many drawers, and each drawer was labeled with the food it contained. Buckwheat, rice, barley, onions, carrots, potatoes, mushrooms. Once a week, Dr. Fischelson put on his wide-brimmed black hat, took a basket in one hand and Spinoza's ethics in the other, and went off to the market for his provisions. While he was waiting to be served, he would open the ethics. The merchants knew him and would motion him to their stalls. A fine piece of cheese, doctor, just melts in your mouth. Fresh mushrooms, doctor, straight from the woods. Make way for the doctor, ladies, the butcher would shout. Please don't block the entrance. 
During the early days of his sickness, Dr. Fischelson had still gone in the evening to a cafe, which was frequented by Hebrew teachers and other intellectuals. It had been his habit to sit there and play chess while drinking a half a glass of black coffee. Sometimes he would stop at the bookstores on Holy Cross Street, where all sorts of old books and magazines could be purchased cheap. On one occasion, a former pupil of his had arranged to meet him at a restaurant one evening. When Dr. Fischelson arrived, he had been surprised to find a group of friends and admirers who forced him to sit at the head of the table while they made speeches about him. But these were things that had happened long ago. Now people were no longer interested in him. He had isolated himself completely and had become a forgotten man. The events of 1905, when the boys of Market Street had begun to organize strikes, throw bombs at police stations and shoot strike breakers so that the stores were closed even on weekdays, had greatly increased his isolation. He began to despise everything associated with the modern Jew. Zionism, socialism, anarchism. The young men in question seemed to him nothing but an ignorant rabble intent on destroying society without which no reasonable existence was possible. He still read a Hebrew magazine occasionally, but he felt contempt for modern Hebrew, which had no roots in the Bible or the Mishnah. The spelling of Polish words had changed also. Dr. Fischelson concluded that even the so-called spiritual men had abandoned reason and were doing their utmost to pander to the mob. Now and again he still visited a library and browsed through some of the modern histories of philosophy, but he found that the professors did not understand Spinoza, quoted him incorrectly, attributed their own muddled ideas to the philosopher. Although Dr. Fischelson was well aware that anger was an emotion unworthy of those who walk the path of reason, he would become furious and would quickly close the book and push it from him. Idiots, he would mutter. Asses upstarts, and he would vow never again to look at modern philosophy. Every three months, a special mailman who only delivered money orders brought Dr. Fischelson 80 rubles. He expected his quarterly allotment at the beginning of July, but as day after day passed and the tall man with the blonde mustache and the shiny buttons did not appear, the doctor grew anxious. He had scarcely a groschen left. Who knows? Possibly the Berlin community had rescinded his subsidy. Perhaps Dr. Hildesheimer had died, God forbid. The post office might have made a mistake. Every event has its cause, Dr. Fischelson knew. All was determined, all necessary, and a man of reason had no right to worry. Nevertheless, worry invaded his brain and buzzed about like the flies. If the worst came to the worst, it occurred to him he could commit suicide. But then he remembered that Spinoza did not approve of suicide and compared those who took their own lives to the insane. One day, when Dr. Fischelson went out to a store to purchase a composition book, he heard people talking about the war. In Serbia somewhere, an Austrian prince had been shot and the Austrians had delivered an ultimatum to the Serbs. The owner of the store, a young man with a yellow beard and shifty yellow eyes, announced, We are about to have a small war. And he advised Dr. Fischelson to store up food, because in the near future there was likely to be a shortage. Everything happened so quickly. Dr. Fischelson had not even decided whether it was worthwhile to spend a four groschen on a newspaper, and already posters had been hung up announcing mobilization. Men were to be seen walking on the streets with round metal tags on their lapels, a sign that they were being drafted. They were followed by their crying wives. One Monday, when Dr. Fischelson descended to the street to buy some food with his last copex, he found the stores closed. The owners and their wives stood outside and explained that merchandise was unobtainable. But certain special customers were pulled to one side and led in through the back doors. On the street, all was confusion. Policemen with swords unsheathed could be seen riding on horseback. A large crowd had gathered around the tavern, where at the command of the Tsar, the tavern stock of whiskey was being poured into the gutter. Dr. Fischelson went to his old cafe. Perhaps he would find some acquaintances there who would advise him but he did not come across a single person he knew. 
He decided then to visit the rabbi of the synagogue, where he had once been librarian, but the sexton with a six-sided skullcap informed him that the rabbi and his family had gone off to the spas. Dr. Fischelson had other friends in town, but he found no one at home. His feet ached from so much walking. Black and green spots appeared before his eyes, and he felt faint. He stopped and waited for the giddiness to pass. The passers-by jostled him. A dark-eyed high school girl tried to give him a coin. Although the war had just started, soldiers, eight abreast, were marching in full battle dress. The men were covered with dust and were sunburnt. Canteens were strapped to their sides, and there were rows of bullets across their chests. The bayonets on their rifles gleamed with a cold green light. They sang with mournful voices. Along with the men came cannons, each pulled by eight horses. Their blind muzzles breathed gloomy terror. Dr. Fischelson felt nauseous. His stomach ached. His intestines seemed about to turn themselves inside out. Cold sweat appeared on his face. I'm dying, he thought. This is the end. Nevertheless, he did manage to drag himself home, where he lay down on the iron cot and remained panting and gasping. He must have dozed off because he imagined that he was in his hometown, Tishwitz. He had a sore throat, and his mother was busy wrapping a stocking stuffed with hot salt around his neck. He could hear talk going on in the house, something about a candle and about how a frog had bitten him. He wanted to go out into the street, but they wouldn't let him because a Catholic procession was passing by. Men in long robes, holding double-edged axes in their hands, were intoning in Latin as they sprinkled holy water. Crosses gleamed, sacred pictures waved in the air. There was an odor of incense and corpses. Suddenly the sky turned a burning red, and the whole world started to burn. Bells were ringing. People rushed madly about. Flocks of birds flew overhead, screeching. Dr. Fischelson awoke with a start. His body was covered with sweat, and his throat was now actually sore. He tried to meditate about his extraordinary dream, to find its rational connection with what was happening to him, and to comprehend it subspecie eternitatis, but none of it made sense. Alas, the brain is a receptacle for nonsense, Dr. Fischelson thought. This earth belongs to the mad. And he once more closed his eyes, once more he dozed, once more he dreamed. The eternal laws apparently had not yet obtained Dr. Fischelson's end. There was a door to the left of Dr. Fischelson's attic room, which opened off a dark corridor cluttered with boxes and baskets, in which the odor of fried onions and laundry soap was always present. Behind this door lived a spinster, whom the neighbors called Black Dobe. Dobe was tall and lean and as black as a baker's shovel. She had a broken nose, and there was a mustache on her upper lip. She spoke with a hoarse voice of a man, and she wore men's shoes. For years Black Dobe had sold breads, rolls, and bagels, which she had bought from the baker at the gate of the house. But one day... She and the baker had quarreled, and she had moved her business to the marketplace, and now she dealt in what were called wrinklers, which was a synonym for cracked eggs. Black Dobe had no luck with men. Twice she had been engaged to baker's apprentices, but in both instances they had returned the engagement contract to her. Sometime afterwards she had received an engagement contract from an old man, a glacier who claimed that he was divorced, but it had later come to light that he still had a wife. Black Dobby had a cousin in America, a shoemaker, and repeatedly she boasted that this cousin was sending her passage. But she remained in Warsaw. She was constantly being teased by the women who would say, eh, there's no hope for you, Dobby. You're fated to die an old maid. Dobby always answered, I don't intend to be a slave for any man. Let them all rot. That afternoon, Dobby received a letter from America. Generally, she would go to Laser the tailor and have him read it to her. However, that day Laser was out, and so Dobby thought of Dr. Fischelson, whom the other tenants considered a convert, since he never went to prayer. She knocked on the door of the doctor's room, but there was no answer. 
The heretic is probably out, Darby thought, but nevertheless she knocked once more, and this time the door moved slightly. She pushed her way in and stood there, frightened. Dr. Fischelson lay fully clothed on his bed. His face was as yellow as wax. His Adam's apple stuck out prominently. His beard pointed upward. Darby screamed. She was certain that he was dead. But no, his body moved. Darby picked up a glass which stood on the table, ran into the corridor, filled the glass with water from the faucet, hurried back and threw the water into the face of the unconscious man. Dr. Fischelson shook his head and opened his eyes. What's wrong with you? Darby asked. Are you sick? Uh, thank you very much. No. Have your family? I'll call them. No, no family. Dobby wanted to fetch the barber from across the street, but Dr. Fischelson signified that he didn't wish the barber's assistance. Since Dobby was not going to the market that day, no wrinklers being available, she decided to do a good deed. She assisted the sick man to get off the bed and smoothed down the blanket. Then she undressed Dr. Fischelson and prepared some soup for him on the kerosene stove. The sun never entered Dobby's room, but here, squares of sunlight shimmered on the faded walls. The floor was painted red. Over the bed hung a picture of a man who was wearing a broad frill around his neck and had long hair. Such an old fellow, and yet he keeps his place so nice and clean, Darby thought approvingly. Dr. Fischelson asked for the ethics, and she gave it to him disapprovingly. She was certain it was a Gentile prayer book. Then she began bustling about brought in a pail of water, swept the floor. Dr. Fischelson ate. After he had finished, he was much stronger, and Dobby asked him to read her the letter. He read it, slowly, the paper trembling in his hands. It came from New York, from Dobby's cousin. Once more he wrote that he was about to send her a really important letter and a ticket to America. By now, Dobby knew the story by heart, and she helped the old man decipher her cousin's scrawl. He's lying, Dobby said. He forgot about me a long time ago. In the evening, Dobby came again. A candle in a brass holder was burning on the chair next to the bed. Reddish shadows trembled on the walls and ceiling. Dr. Fischelson sat propped up in bed reading a book. The candle threw a golden light on his forehead, which seemed as if cleft in two. A bird had flown in through the window and was perched on the table. For a moment, Dobby was frightened. This man made her think of witches, of black mirrors and corpses wandering around at night, terrifying women. Nevertheless, she took a few steps toward him and inquired, How are you? Any better? A little, thank you. Are you really a convert? she asked, although she wasn't quite sure what the word meant. Me a convert? No. I'm a Jew like any other Jew, Dr. Fischelson answered. The doctor's assurances made Dobby feel more at home. She found a bottle of kerosene and lit the stove, and after that she fetched a glass of milk from her room and began cooking kasha. Dr. Fischelson continued to study the ethics, but that evening he could make no sense of the theorems and proofs with their many references to axioms and definitions and other theorems. With trembling hand, he raised the book to his eyes and read, The idea of each modification of the human body does not involve adequate knowledge of the human body itself. The idea of the idea of each modification of the human mind does not involve adequate knowledge of the human mind. Dr. Fischelson was certain he would die any day now. He made out his will, leaving all of his books and manuscripts to the synagogue library. His clothing and furniture would go to Dabe, since she had taken care of him. But death did not come. Rather, his health improved. Dabe returned to her business in the market, but she visited the old man several times a day, preparing soup for him, left him a glass of tea, and told him news of the war. The Germans had occupied Kalish, Bendin, and Chestacho, and they were marching on Warsaw. People said that on a quiet morning one could hear the rumblings of the cannon. Darby reported that the casualties were heavy, 
They are falling like flies, she said. What a terrible misfortune for the women. She couldn't explain why, but the old man's attic room attracted her. She liked to remove the gold-rimmed books from the bookcase, dust them, and then air them on the windowsill. She would climb the few steps to the window and look out through the telescope. She also enjoyed talking to Dr. Fischelson. He told her about Switzerland, where he had studied, of the great cities he had passed through, of the high mountains that were covered with snow even in the summer. His father had been a rabbi, he said, and before he, Dr. Fischelson, had become a student, he had attended a yeshiva. She asked him how many languages he knew, and it turned out that he could speak and write Hebrew, Russian, German, and French, in addition to Yiddish. He also knew Latin. Dobby was astonished that such an educated man should live in an attic room on Market Street, but what amazed her most of all was that although he had the title doctor, he couldn't write prescriptions. Why don't you become a real doctor, she would ask him. I am a doctor, he would answer. I'm just not a physician. What kind of a doctor? A doctor of philosophy. Although she had no idea what this meant, she felt it must be very important. Oh, my blessed mother, she would say, where did you get such a brain? Then one evening, after Dobby had given him his crackers and his glass of tea with milk, he began questioning her about where she came from, who her parents were, and why she had not married. Dobby was surprised. No one had ever asked her such questions. She told him her story in a quiet voice and stayed until 11 o'clock. Her father had been a porter at the kosher butcher shops. Her mother had plucked chickens in the slaughterhouse. The family had lived in a cellar at number 19 Market Street. When she had been 10, she had become a maid. The man she had worked for had been a fence who bought stolen goods from thieves on the square. Dobe had had a brother who had gone into the Russian army and had never returned. Her sister had married a coachman in Praga and had died in childbirth. Dobby told of the battles between the underworld and the revolutionaries in 1905, of Blind Itche and his gang and how they collected protection money from the stores, of the thugs who attacked young boys and girls out on Saturday afternoon strolls if they were not paid money for security. She also spoke of the pimps who drove about in carriages and abducted women to be sold in Buenos Aires. Darby swore that some men had even sought to inveigle her into a brothel, but that she had run away. She complained of a thousand evils done to her. She had been robbed. Her boyfriend had been stolen. A competitor had once poured a pint of kerosene into her basket of bagels. Her own cousin, the shoemaker, had cheated her out of a hundred rubles before he had left for America. Dr. Fischelson listened to her attentively. He asked her questions, shook his head and grunted. Well, do you believe in God? He finally asked her. I don't know, she answered. Do you? Yes, I believe. Then why don't you go to the synagogue? She asked. God is everywhere, he replied, in the synagogue, in the marketplace, in this very room. We ourselves are parts of God. Don't say such things, Darby said. You frighten me. She left the room, and Dr. Fischelson was certain she had gone to bed. But he wondered why she had not said good night. I probably drove her away with my philosophy, he thought. The very next moment he heard her footsteps. She came in carrying a pile of clothing like a peddler. I wanted to show you these, she said. They're my trousseau. And she began to spread out on the chair dresses, woolen, silk, velvet. Taking each dress in turn, she held it to her body. She gave him an account of every item in her trousseau, underwear, shoes, stockings. I'm not wasteful, she said. I'm a saver. I have enough money to go to America. Then she was silent, and her face turned brick red. She looked at Dr. Fischelson out of the corner of her eyes, timidly inquisitively. Dr. Fischelson's body suddenly began to shake as if he had the chills. Very nice, beautiful things. His brow furrowed and he pulled at his beard with two fingers. 
A sad smile appeared on his toothless mouth, and his large, fluttering eyes, gazing into the distance through the attic window, also smiled sadly. The day that Black Dobby came to the rabbi's chambers and announced that she was to marry Dr. Fischelson, the rabbi's wife thought she had gone mad. But the news had already reached Laser the tailor, and it spread to the bakery as well as to other shops. There were those who thought that the old maid was very lucky. The doctor, they said, had a vast hoard of money. But there were others who took the view that he was a run-down degenerate who would give her syphilis. Although Dr. Fischelson had insisted that the wedding be a small, quiet one, a host of guests assembled in the rabbi's rooms. The baker's apprentices, who generally went about barefoot and in their underwear, with paper bags on the tops of their heads, now put on light-colored suits, straw hats, yellow shoes, gaudy ties, and they brought with them huge cakes and pans filled with cookies. They had even managed to find a bottle of vodka, although liquor was forbidden in wartime. When the bride and groom entered the rabbi's chamber, a murmur arose from the crowd. The women could not believe their eyes. The woman that they saw was not the one they had known. Dobbe wore a wide-brimmed hat which was amply adored with cherries, grapes, and plumes, and the dress that she had on was of white silk and was equipped with a train. On her feet were high-heeled shoes, gold in color, and from her thin neck hung a string of imitation pearls. Nor was this all. Her fingers sparkled with rings and glittering stones. Her face was veiled. She looked almost like one of those rich brides who were married in the Vienna Hall. The baker's apprentices whistled mockingly. As for Dr. Fischelson, he was wearing his black coat and broad-toed shoes. He was scarcely able to walk. He was leaning on Dobby. When he saw the crowd from the doorway, he became frightened and began to retreat. But Dobby's former employer approached him, saying, Come in, come in, bridegroom. Don't be bashful. We're all brethren now. The ceremony proceeded according to the law. The rabbi, in a worn satin gabardine, wrote the marriage contract and then had the bride and groom touch his handkerchief as a token of agreement. The rabbi wiped the point of the pen on his skullcap. Several porters, who had been called from the street to make up the quorum, supported the canopy. Dr. Fischelson put on a white robe as a reminder of the day of his death, and Dobby walked around him seven times as custom required. The light from the braided candles flickered on the walls. The shadows wavered. Having poured wine into a goblet, the rabbi chanted the benedictions in a sad melody. Dobbe uttered only a single cry. As for the other women, they took out their lace handkerchiefs and stood with them in their hands, grimacing. When the baker's boys began to whisper wisecracks to each other, the rabbi put a finger to his lips and murmured, hey, No, 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 oh, no, as a sign that talking was forbidden. The moment came to slip the wedding ring on the bride's finger, but the bridegroom's hand started to tremble, and he had trouble locating Dobby's index finger. The next thing, according to custom, was the smashing of the glass. But though Dr. Fischelson kicked the goblet several times, it remained unbroken. The girls lowered their heads, pinched each other gleefully, and giggled. Finally, one of the apprentices struck the goblet with his heel, and it shattered. Even the rabbi could not restrain a smile. After the ceremony, the guests drank vodka and ate cookies. Dobby's former employer came up to Dr. Fischelson and said, Mazeltov bridegroom, your luck should be as good as your wife. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Fischelson murmured, but I don't look forward to any luck. He was anxious to return as quickly as possible to his attic room. He felt a pressure in his stomach and his chest ached. His face had become greenish. Dobby had suddenly become angry. She pulled back her veil and called out to the crowd, what are you laughing at? This isn't a show. And without picking up the cushion cover in which the gifts were wrapped, she returned with her husband to their rooms on the fifth floor. Dr. Fischelson lay down on the freshly made bed in his room and began reading the ethics. Dobber had gone back to her own room. 
The doctor had explained to her that he was an old man, that he was sick and without strength. He had promised her nothing. Nevertheless, she returned wearing a silk nightgown, slippers with pom-poms, and with her hair hanging over her shoulders. There was a smile on her face, and she was bashful and hesitant. Dr. Fischelson trembled, and the ethics dropped from his hands. The candle went out. Dobbe groped for Dr. Fischelson in the dark and kissed his mouth. My dear husband, she whispered to him, muzzle tough. What happened that night could be called a miracle. If Dr. Fischelson hadn't been convinced that every occurrence is in accordance with the laws of nature, he would have thought that Black Dobbe had bewitched him. Powers long dormant awakened in him. Although he had had only a sip of the benediction wine, he was as if intoxicated. He kissed Dobby and spoke to her of love, long-forgotten quotations from Klopstock, Lessing, Goethe, rose to his lips. The pressures and aches stopped. He embraced Dobby, pressed her to himself, was again a man, as in his youth. Dobby was faint with delight. Crying, she murmured things to him in a Warsaw slang which he did not understand. Later, Dr. Fischelson slipped off into the deep sleep young men know. He dreamed that he was in Switzerland, and that he was climbing mountains, running, falling, flying. At dawn, he opened his eyes. It seemed to him that someone had blown into his ears. Dobbe was snoring. Dr. Fischelson quietly got out of bed. In his long nightshirt, he approached the window, walked up the steps and looked out in wonder. Market Street was asleep, breathing with a deep stillness. The gas lamps were flickering. The black shutters on the stores were fastened with iron bars. A cool breeze was blowing. Dr. Fischelson looked up at the sky. The black arch was thickly sown with stars. There were green, red, yellow, blue stars. There were large ones and small ones, winking and steady ones. There were those that were clustered in dense groups and those that were alone. In the higher sphere, apparently, little notice was taken of the fact that a certain Dr. Fischelson had, in his declining days, married someone called Black Dobby. Seen from above, even the Great War was nothing but a temporary play of the modes. The myriads of fixed stars continued to travel their destined courses in unbounded space. The comets, planets, satellites, asteroids kept circling these shining centers. Worlds were born and died in cosmic upheavals. In the chaos of nebulae, primeval matter was being formed. Now and again, a star tore loose and swept across the sky, leaving behind it a fiery streak. It was the month of August when there are showers of meteors. Yes, the divine substance was extended and had neither beginning nor end. It was absolute, indivisible, eternal, without duration, infinite in its attributes. Its waves and bubbles danced in the universal cauldron, seething with change, following the unbroken chain of causes and effects. And he, Dr. Fischelson, with his unavoidable fate, was part of this. The doctor closed his eyelids and allowed the breeze to cool the sweat on his forehead and stir the hair of his beard. He breathed deeply of the midnight air, supported his shaky hands on the window sill, and murmured, Divine Spinoza, forgive me, I have become a fool. Production copyright 1986 by the Audio Partners Publishing Corporation. All rights reserved. The Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is also pleased to be the publisher of Great American Short Stories, a collection of short stories by Mark Twain, Stephen Crane, Ambrose Bierce, and Jack London. For a free audio editions catalog offering thousands of audiobooks on cassette and compact disc from all major publishers, call toll-free 
1-800-231-4261. Visit our website at www.audioeditions.com.